So what do I think about 2050? I think we'll have a few billion more people on the world. In October, we'll be at 7 billion. By mid-2050, it'll probably be 9.5. So we'll have another 2.5 billion on the planet. In the rich countries, we might have 50 million more. Might have 50 million more. And they will be older, and they will have greater needs. The youth of the world is going to be in the developing countries. The needs of the world are going to be in the developing countries. The answer is taking some responsibility, a responsibility to tell our kids that they're going to grow up in a different world. We can't wait for 2050 to adjust our thinking. We should be doing it today. So this is not a continent that we can now ignore. It's a continent that we've succeeded in ignoring for many years in most cases. As president of the World Bank, I could not. I went very quickly to Africa and went two or three times a year and managed to get to 38 of the 53 countries. There are 53 countries in Africa. It is a hell of a place to get your arms around. And the countries are very different both in terms of their integrity and in terms of their governance and in terms of just about everything. But you cannot ignore close to 2 billion people in a world of 9.5 billion. It's not possible. And our kids will have to think about that. That uh, education is critical. I don't want to comment on the education system in this country. I, I saw that the kids are going back to school and they, four fifths of them are going to public school and one fifth are going to private schools and I no doubt that 5,000 plus students will have a good education. But that unfortunately is not true in many other countries in the world. It's certainly not true in the United States where we're now ranking 20th and 22nd in terms of science and mass education. Number one is China, not surprisingly. Singapore is up there. Formosa is up there. The move is, and India is up there. So we're seeing an inevitable shift to Asia, which most of us are ignoring. It's too comfortable to think about. It. It's playing out in the United States, although President Obama is now trying to project that forward and work to the new congressionally mandated amount of money that is coming for additional monies to stimulate the United States in a three and a half billion dollar package. And some amount of that is being left for the decision of what happens in the future. And that is currently being debated by a group of congressmen and senators. And the president has come in and said, well, I want $400 billion of that for this new program. And we will see in the course of the next week or two or months whether that stimulus package will be approved. It's difficult in the United States because they've already borrowed 65% of their GDP, of their income. More if you don't subtract certain assets. It's around 80-90%. And this is what is happening in many countries in the world. And uh, the question is, will the Western world decide that there is a limit to what it can continue to borrow, and that it has to worry about tomorrow, and it has to worry about what it leaves our children? The most uh, vigorous being Greece. But there were not provisions in the European economic community uh, rules and that was sufficient to deal with the question of Greece borrowing too much money. And so that's something which will now have to be dealt with. But Mrs. Merkel this morning, and I read the communique this morning, has now come out and really for the first time she's been forced to draw the line on Greece and saying we can't let this thing go on in the future the way it is now. We have to hold them accountable. So that issue is now being debated, and I think it's very likely that Greece will be held uh, to account. This, in a way, is the issue that confronts the $440 billion that uh, 
Europe has agreed to put up as a package, but which Germany has now signaled is the limit. It is that the growth is now coming in the developing countries. It is that the growth is now coming in the developing countries, and in particular China and India. China will grow probably at around 8% this year, India 7%. The developing countries as a group may be around 5%, Brazil may be around 4%. The United States will be lucky to make it to 1.5%. And if my understanding is correct, Europe also is under some pressure. But my colleague here may well comment later on the European situation. He's very good at putting a positive slot on Europe. And I hope you're able to do that today. We'll see. I will. Yeah. The French are very good at that sort of thing. <laughs> A double dip, uh, another drop in the economy. It's, it's a double dip, and uh, he thinks this is a way to do it. And the president coming in with his new stimulus package of over 400 billion is the other leg to try and make this happen. Unemployment rate be reduced from the 9.1 percent that it is now. I think for all of us uh, in Europe and in the United States, we have this huge move. Asia, which few of us understand. Regrettably, fewer of our kids understand. That uh, whereas there are hundreds of thousands of Chinese and Indians studying the world, the United States numbers are that 13,000 students are studying in China and, th and 3,100 in India. That's not a very large number for a return event. And the same, I regret to say, is relatively true in terms of Australia, which I just left. Housing prices, I'm sure not uh, in Monaco, but in other places, are going down. In the United States, we're 35%, lower than we were uh, less than five years ago. Consumer spending is down for the very first time in the month of June than it has been in a series of years. So it is a very very serious moment in the global economy, which uh, too few people seem to recognize. But that's just speaking about the rich world and China and India. But there are other issues which we need to face. The Middle East is not a trivial issue. There are 350 million people in the Middle East. We have seen significant changes in terms of governance in several of those countries. We've seen a coming together of the kingdoms and the princely uh, uh, areas to try and hold the line in terms of what is going on in the Middle East. But if you saw the demonstrations in the streets, initially from Algeria, then from Egypt, uh, and the infected countries elsewhere, what was fascinating was, as you saw the people in the streets, there were no signs that were anti-Israel. There were signs that were about jobs. 65% of the population in the Middle East is under the age of 28. And if they can't get jobs, they're not very happy. It's not a question of positive extremism, it's a question of getting jobs. So, uh, the Middle East is, a, is an area that is now waking up in terms of equity and social justice. The other area which we rarely mention, which is, will be 22% of the world's population, is Africa. Can you imagine that there'll be close to 2 billion people in Africa by 2050, the day that we're talking about? That'll be 2 billion out of 9. The capital incomes have gone up. But I regret to say poverty, which was made an effort, is still a big issue. When I got to the World Bank, uh, we were talking about three billion people living under two dollars a day. A billion, two hundred million of them living under a dollar a day. It became a passion for me to try and deal with it. Well, we've cut it down by some few hundred million, but you still have close to a billion people living under a dollar and a quarter a day. If you imagine what that is like. And you've seen pictures of the working, walking, 10, 15 days to try and get some food and try and get some water. 
It's a long way away from the Western world, but it is reality. And these are real people. And they're in a real world. And we're not doing a hell of a lot about it, unfortunately, to try and address that. Uh, he is still alive and well, and uh, sadly, it's in Africa. But a bigger number of today are in India. And uh, we need to help the Indian government uh, try and deal with that. I haven't yet dealt with the question of environment. But we're slowly destroying the world. And um, I was limited by my chairman to 30 minutes, so let me just simply say that the issue of environment, the issue of water, the issue of global temperature is not a trivial issue to deal with. We now have literally hundreds of organizations in the public sector and thousands in the private sector that are dealing with the issues of global development. We're not yet able to control or to rationalize the contributions of these very well-meaning organizations. And in the private sector, we're getting an average size of project which is under $100,000. So they're not going to have much time and effort to report. And in the public sector, it's dropped from somewhere approaching $3 million to something a bit over $1 million. So the proliferation of projects is killing us. Now, it's hoped that gradually we'll be able to bring this under control. And the number of people that are in the field will get together. We now have more than 260 multilateral organizations working in the field of development. That's more than the countries that we have. The UN system is contributing 4%. So they're all outside the human system, or the large majority of them. In the private sector, in 1996, there were 17,000 uh, private sector projects being done in India. In 2008, there were 99,000.